So thank you to all the organizers for giving me this opportunity to talk. So the basic outline of my talk is the following. So I'll first talk about the motivation, like what led us to basically look at such a quantum model, which can possibly look for soft uh, uh, photons effects. So I'll talk about the first the relation between the symmetries, memory, and soft theorems, and how it was used by Hawking Perry Strominger to talk about software for black holes. After that, I'll talk about how why we want to know about the soft photons effects on quantum systems, and then I'll talk about the model, and then I'll show you the calculation about the excitation and de excitation rates of the model, and then I'll summarize. So this talk is based on these papers, especially the uh, last one. So the motivation is the following. So we know about the gravitational memory effect. So it basically tells us that if you have the system of configuration of let's say test particles or inertial particles, which are let's say far off from the source and there is a gravitational wave which passes perpendicular through it, then it changes shape. But uh, after the wave has passed, it is not necessary for the configuration to come back to the same initial configuration, but it may retain some memory in terms of the change of distances as you can see in this particular the bottom picture. Okay, so uh, there are different types of uh, memory effect, the linear non-memory effect. There is also a displacement version, there is the velocity version, etc. So this is one aspect. The other aspects are these BMS symmetries, which are the extension of the translation symmetries, which we usually know for flat space-time. So uh, Bondi, Mersner and Sachs, when they try to figure out what are the uh, type of symmetries which should act at asymptotically flat space-times, let's say at null infinity, they found that there, is, there are infinity of uh, such translations. One can think of the super translations as doing a time translation, but at a different angle. So in this Penrose picture, you can see that if you perform, let's say, a time translation, which is dependent on the angle, okay, then this basically allows us to keep the leading order uh, term of the metric as the flat Minkowski metric. And then you have certain uh, corrections, which so follow some certain fall of properties. So because of this uh, uh, infinite number of symmetries, BMS symmetries, one can also define, let's say, uh, uh, charges. Okay, so uh, these charges then uh, can be uh, basically defined to follow a lot of conservation uh, relations. So the charge which is defined on the past null infinity and they are connected to the charges defined on the future null infinity. So we have basically a infinite number of uh, conserved charges, okay, which is related to the hard charge. Uh, and they basically follow uh, these relations. Now, there is a nice connection between the memory effect and the symmetries, okay? And on the third vertex, it is also connected to soft uh, theorems, which basically uh, we have studied what happens to, if you have soft particles which are emitted during, let's say, uh, processes involving hard particles, then in principle, you could have, let's say, soft particles being uh, emitted in any given uh, 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 scattering reaction. So these three effects are basically connected by uh, some mathematical identities, okay? But the interesting part is like there is, a, uh, the uh, idea is like there is some initial vacuum and then there is a later vacuum and they are basically connected to each other by something which happens in the middle. So for example, in the memory, there is a gravitational wave which passes in between. So you have a vacuum before and after. In asymptotic symmetry, you are basically just uh, doing a diffeomorphism transformation, let's say to the metric. So you are just transforming a Minkowski metric uh, to a Minkowski metric, which is, uh, let's say the asymptotically flat part of the metric at boundary. And then similarly with soft theorem, these soft particles basically do not have any energy. So you, you can transform from one vacuum to another without changing the energy, but you can add uh, so-called this soft particles. Now, this, uh, this relation is not just related to gravity, but it's, it also holds for the electromagnetic case. So you have a corresponding electromagnetic memory effect, and then you have the U1 gauge symmetries, large U1 gauge symmetries at null infinity, which allows you to define, let's say, the corresponding charges which we saw in gravity. So here you would have the soft uh, charges corresponding to the electromagnetic case, and the soft theorems would correspond to, let's say, the soft photons. So there is this nice connection. So using these ideas, uh, it was proposed by Hawking Perry Strominger that perhaps uh, uh, this could uh, uh, allow us to have some uh, uh, info about what happens in the black hole information paradox. So they concluded that the black holes have software. So uh, looking at the uh, charge defined at the past null infinities and then equating it to future null infinities, you have a lot many conservation laws. So perhaps there is uh, 
there are many correlations among the outgoing hopping pairs which we are basically missing which could be there in the uh, in this extra soft hairs okay now there is also critiques on this same proposal so i mentioned few of them over here but uh, anyway so what we wanted to look at is a basically a physical process version with which you could see whether these correlations between the outgoing hopping pairs could essentially change so there are two aspects of it okay one is the classical memory and there is uh, there is another uh, the quantum type of memory so what the essential idea is let's say you have some kind of a matter shock wave which falls into the black hole and this matter shock wave is defined in such a way that it is basically related to this part of the space time and the other part of the space time which are essentially just the bms type of uh, super translations at the boundary so you just stitch the two space times together and you define that matter shock wave and once it falls in it's like acting on the symmetry at the boundary but this uh, matter shock wave when it basically crosses the horizons it will induce some non trivial uh, translations at the horizons which perhaps can encode some additional info in, in the outgoing hopping pairs okay so the classical effect would be to understand what happens due to the uh, because of this wave on uniformly accelerated observers okay so because these observers which are at r equal to constant these are the observers who observe the hawking radiation so uh, basically what we found is once the wave passes it retains a memory in the form of a basically a, a, a drift velocity okay so these observers they basically get a boost Uh, depending on where they are where how they encounter the wave and they retain a memory the interesting part was among the correlations so i have shown here the uh, entanglement between the outgoing hopping pairs so for example let's say a and b are the two hopping pairs so a is falling inside b has basically come out which we see as hopping radiation then there is another pair c and d so we know that a and b are correlated but there is no correlation between the red and blue ones okay and similarly c and d are uh, correlated but there is no correlation between b and d or a and, a and c but because of this uh, bms type of shock wave what we see is the entanglement basically changes so this is a, a a perturbative calculation in that perturbative calculation we were able to see that the entanglement uh, changes once the wave passes so the entanglement basically degrades to let's say some perturbative uh, parameter lambda square whereas it increases among uh, increases the entanglement between the outgoing hawking pairs to order lambda so this at least goes in the way of uh, showing how the correlations uh, in the hawking pairs can be done using the bms type of uh, symmetries the more type uh, the other type of interesting question that we would li like to ask was how is the uh, soft theorems or the soft photons or the soft gra gravitons going to play a part in this so what essentially we would like to have seen is let's suppose you are looking at this detector okay we we are familiar with this effect that if you have a detector which is let's say moving in minkowski vacuum with a uniform acceleration then we know it will basically see a thermal radiation which is essentially the unruh effect but now is there a way to ask how this detector interacts with the soft particles in the background scalar field and what is the effect of this soft particles on the transition uh, or the excitation or the de excitation rates of the detector so for this purpose we should basically build a detector uh, which is basically sensitive to the soft particles in the background okay so first i will show you what is the usual uh, hamiltonian interaction hamiltonian which is chosen so you, this is the background uh, scalar field it is basically coupled to the uh, detectors let's say some two level system which has a uh, monopole movement this sky is basically a switching function so it determines how long or how the detector basically engages with the background scalar field so we are familiar with the form of the response function which i have basically shown over here it is dependent on this uh, white pitman function which i have shown here so this is basically the pullback of the white pitman function on the trajectory so if you solve this uh, uh, if you do this integral for basically the rindler trajectory we we get the familiar uh, uh, planckian kind of distribution which tells us that this is basically the thermal uh, kind of bar that we are seeing okay so now we would like to basically introduce the soft particles so this is the way we essentially uh, do it so instead of using the uh, couple, uh, the coupling directly to the scalar field we know that the scalar field essentially is not gauge invariant under uh, the gauge transformations uh, which you see here the un gauge transformations the scalar field basically transforms in this following way so this interaction hamiltonian is essentially not gauge invariant 
so uh, we we try to look at a gauge invariant operator which you can define in the following way so you add this extra phase factor with this uh, function uh, c of x which is defined as a two point function integrated over the background uh, uh, vector potential field and there is this extra two point function f of a so as long as this two point function satisfies something like the four dimensional poisson equation which you basically see over here then you can show that if you have this combined factor the scalar field and this extra phase factor under these type of gauge transformations okay this uh, capital phi is basically gauge invariant okay so we are essentially going to use this gauge invariant operator uh, to somehow construct a, a detector so what is the nice thing about is uh, about it is so along with the background scalar field our uh, detector is also going to automatically couple to the electromagnetic field through this uh, factor which we have here the c factor uh, which uh, which is there in this equation okay so uh, what is the physical significance of that particular phase factor so let's assume that if you choose the two point uh, function to have this particular uh, form uh, then the uh, four dimensional poisson condition actually uh, gets reduced to the usual three dimensional uh, uh, it, this is like, this looks like uh, the Maxwell's first equation. Okay, so in three dimensions. So then you can interpret the uh, this particular function, this vector field which you see here, which has three index values. Okay, it is essentially uh, like a vector field, but which is sourced by a delta function and then a point charge over here. So if you try the usual operator algebra, you can see that if given a particular state. Okay, with some uh, uh, electric field which is acted upon by this uh, uh, scalar field operator, the gauge invariant scalar field operator. If you try to find out what is the electric field in this particular state, then you would see that it uh, also picks up this particular extra factor which is given by the uh, electric field you have introduced in the uh, the phase. Okay, so what it tells you is essentially this uh, gauge invariant field when it acts on the vacuum, it the uh, no, it doesn't just create the charged part of the uh, the charged particle corresponding to the scalar field, but it also incorporates the electric field of the charged particle. Okay, so a, a charge when it's created, it automatically has the electric field around it, and this construction basically uh, gives you the way to basically handle it as uh, together. Okay, now the the thing is that uh, this electric field need not be just the Coulomb. Uh, electric field of the charge you can on top of it you can basically add any part of dressing which you like so like for example the soft uh, photon dressing and that is exactly what we are going to do okay so how this uh, so how, uh, so how does the calculation proceed we basically use the uh, linear perturbation uh, uh, theory so to the lowest order we basically quant just quantize both the uh, vector potential and the scalar field uh, basically as free field so this is basically the quantization you can see that a and b are basically the uh, creation and annihilation operator corresponding to the positively and negatively charged particles okay satisfying the usual uh, commutation relations and we define the vacuum uh, with the help of the annihilation operators as you can see in the last statement okay similarly we basically quantize the vector potential in the coulomb gate and uh, uh, the uh, uh, so here you will have two degrees of freedom which are basically represented by the polarization two polarization vectors which you see here and d are essentially the creation and annihilation operators of the photons for photons now the vacuum here is defined with respect to the annihilation operator in the same way uh, that you usually do so this is about the background electromagnetic field and the scalar field now how do we define the detector so since our uh, field is a charge scalar field we cannot uh, use the uh, just the scalar type of uh, monopole moment so we basically look at the charged monopole moment which also creates the corresponding the particle antiparticle uh, type of pairs so we basically define the uh, background orthonormal basis as a tensor product of this uh, pair of this uh, conjugate particles the particle and the antiparticle okay but we are only considering like two type of states the uh, let's if you call the zero uh, wedge zero as the ground state then possibly these are the type of excited states that you would see the one zero zero one and one one okay but since we are going to work only with linear perturbation order theory uh, we won't basically uh, get the one one kind of state we will basically uh, say that the one zero and zero one state are the excited states for us and these are the uh, 
that the operator algebras are the usual operator uh, the commutation relations for the operators are the usual ones which are similar to uh, those in the kind of the scalar field so the states Sometimes are again we, defined yes we are running out of time so yeah, yeah i'll finish in three four minutes yeah so i'll just show uh, what the calculations give you we are already out of time so okay if you can't conclude yeah, okay. fast yeah so uh, this is the interaction hamiltonian okay so we basically uh, couple the detector to the background uh, field in this particular way you can see that the interaction hamiltonian is basically hermitian so it preserves the uh, total charge of the system okay and the uh, we will couple basically the detector to the initial state of the background field which is basically the vacuum state of the field of both the scalar field and the electromagnetic field and the detector will also be taken to be the lowest uh, 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 the, the lowest state which is the zero zero state then uh, if you try to compute the amplitude of uh, what happens if, if you want to go to the uh, excited state of the detector and let's say some state a and phi and from here you can compute the probability by basically sum, summing over about all the possible states of the background fields then you get the response function okay now you should just look at the response function it has a very form similar to the usual Whitman function except that in place of the usual scalar fields we now have the gauge invariant uh, fields which we basically define one nice thing is if you try to work it out they basically factorize into two parts the first in one factor is just the usual Whitman field which you basically get in the usual case without the gauge invariant function and then it is multiplied by this particular other factor okay which depends on the particular dressing so we try to work it for a particular type of dressing which you see over here so this is not exactly the coulomb type of field it has a particular angular dependence and that angular dependence essentially captures the uh, soft photons uh, which is there in this dressing field the corresponding soft charges you can determine uh, through this soft dressing field in the following form which you see in the uh, the equations which i show over here okay so this is the dressing field which we choose in the gauge invariant operator now if you put the detector on an inertial trajectory so this is the simplest case which we dealt with first so what we found is the response function okay uh, the, it has this particular following form okay where this q tilde essentially depends on the soft charges okay so it, it is uh, not directly on the soft charges it is some kind of a noise of the soft charges which you see in the background okay so you have to square it and then the uh, the average is over over on certain angles and if you set this q to zero then you get the usual uh, uh, excitation and de-excitation rate. So note that uh, the uh, excitation rate is zero as because the vacuum should not basically excite our detector. But in case if you start with the detector in the excited state, then it can have a, a de-excitation. But the de-excitation rate now depends on this uh, factor Q tilde, which is basically dependent on the, uh, the soft charges, which is in the in uh, connection, uh, which is interconnected to the soft photons. So essentially what we see is the transition rate is dependent on the background dressing and hence the soft photons. So this is for the particular field uh, for soft photon dressing, which I showed you over here. But uh, the same calculation, we also did it for a more general case. So instead of that particular radial uh, 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 soft photon dressing with different ang uh, angle dependence, in general, you can have a general kind of a soft photon dressing, which only depends on, let's say, one by R square fall off, okay? near r zero and near r infinity so even if you have such a general thing we again found that the response function is a dependent on uh, the uh, soft charges or the dressing in form of this chi one factor which you see in the expression okay so uh, we have checked that using contour arguments you can show that the excitation rate is zero as you would want uh, uh, for an inertial trajectory in vacuum but the de-excitation uh, rates are again dependent on the soft charge Okay, so I'll stop here. Okay, thank you. We have uh, time for one uh, quick question. Uh, so there is a question by Mike uh, Good in the chat. Yeah, can you can you hear me, Sandvin? Yes, I can hear you, Mark. Yeah, I, I was just uh, I, I saw that you're using a uniformly accelerated trajectory and uh, using the response function to, to get so to the, we, we yeah. did it only for inertial trajectory we have not done the calculation yet for accelerated trajectory yet so this oh, is just for inertial trajectory just yeah. for inertial okay yeah um but the soft photons are are um in, in all, many contexts are often defined by uh you know a trajectory that gives off a finite energy where you have an infinite number of particles so that the average energy per particle is zero 
Uh, is this a different, uh, what exactly are you, what exactly soft particles are you referring to? Um, so the soft particles are basically coming through this uh, soft charges which you have. So we have added this type of a dressing to the charge. So uh, whenever a scalar charge is created along with that charge, you would have the electric field along with it. So we have not chosen the electric field to be just the Coulomb part. So if it has uh, something in addition to it, then that additional part affects the de-excitation rate. If you kill that additional part, if you kill the soft dressing part, then you get the normal de-excitation rate as you would get for a normal uh, inertial trajectory in the usual case. So this really matters how you choose the dressing field. So it is all the information about the soft uh, particles is actually captured in this uh, dressing in field dressing that we have chosen. Field. Yes. So if, so if you pick the right dressing field, you could you could maybe account for a finite energy emission. Is that is that possible? Do you think? So right now we we aren't seeing any emission uh, because uh, there there is no uh, the excitation rate is actually zero. So we are only getting the de-excitation part because this is just the inertial trajectory. So perhaps, yes, if you give some acceleration, then it would be interesting to see what is the additional contribution along with the usual thermal thing that we get. Okay. All right. Thank you so much then. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay. So thanks, Max, for the question and thanks, Ambed, for the nice talk. Uh, I encourage if there are further questions to put them on Slack. So we now have to move to the next speaker. Thank you so much. Thank you.